All right, welcome to week nine. We're getting into the meat of the course and I'm perfectly thrilled to be able to talk more about object-oriented software design, object-oriented thinking. Uh, to get started, um, we're gonna kind of give an overview of the stuff that, that is in the chapter, what we're learning. Uh, I won't duplicate what's in the chapter. I highly recommend that you read over that. Uh, but I will illustrate a couple of important points and then we will go over an assignment that is very, very similar to the week nine assignment that you're going to have to do for the end of the week. <clears throat> so we're going to start off and we're going to look at our family class that we had in the announcements last week. And uh, it's a very simplistic class. It's built up of strings, basically, where we have the surname and the father's name and the mother's name and then a list of strings that are the children's names. And so strings are cool, but a string just all it can do is just describe one aspect of a person. And so, you know, there's, there's got to be more to a person than just their name, right? There, where there's a little bit more to us. And we could go crazy <clears throat> modeling our software to exactly replicate the real world. But uh, I'll give you an example. Sometimes students say, well, if I'm modeling a person, do I have to model their heartbeat and all their internal organs? And the answer to that is clearly no, unless you are developing an application that monitors heartbeats or catalogs internal organs. You know that In that case, that would be important. But in, in most cases, you'll model only those things that matter to the program. And you know whether they matter or not if they are described in the program requirements or if you're making it up on your own, then you have an idea of what you're trying to accomplish. So you've got your own requirements. And if you do write your own software with your own requirements, I highly recommend that you write them down and treat them formally as requirements that'll make your software life go a lot better. When you're just shooting from the hip all the time, you end up writing spaghetti eventually. So uh, just a little tip there for any side projects that you might try doing on your own. Um, so let's just uh, take a quick review of our simple family. We've got uh, surname, mother, father, children, getters and setters for each of these attributes, and then we've got a list for accessing the children. Uh, we did, uh, didn't did talk about it necessarily last week, um, but uh, the children, I, and, and there was a question asked, why don't we just let people set the mother and father name directly? And the reason is we want to have a little bit of control over what values go in there. Because if we just make our attributes public here and let whoever uses our class set those values, we run the risk that they might set a value that is bad for us, like a null. I mean, and that would just blow up a lot of things in code if we could just randomly set null to properties. And especially in the case of our children, where we're holding this list, and if we reach, if we give people access to the children's list, they could empty it out, they could swap in a new list, and maybe that's not what we want to do in our software. So we wrap all of this up inside getters and setters, and it's just easier that way. So. So the way I've designed this class is to wrap up that children's array and you can get the size and we just pass through the children's size property from the, from the array list. Uh, we can get a specific child by passing in a, uh, the index into that array list. Uh, and then we can add a child one at a time or we can add a child multiples at a time. And this is using an, an elliptical argument, meaning you can have any number of strings as arguments and it'll, get passed into us as an array that we can do a for each on. And, and call uh, this method, call our add child method, actually it looks like we're calling the children array list directly. We're gonna change that a little bit in the things that we do today. But the, uh, we've got our, our uh, add child. And so nobody can delete a child. <laughs> um, we don't, we don't provide access to the array list to where somebody could manually delete it, and we don't provide any methods for being able to delete a child. So once you got them, you're stuck with them. So that's our simple class, but like we said, there is more to a person than just their name. And we'd like to enhance our model a little bit to where there's something more of a person here. And what we've got uh, now is a person class. And you can see here from the attributes that we've got at the top of our class that we store a person's name, we store their gender, and we store their date of birth. 
And if we know their date of birth, we might as well be able to calculate their age too. So we're gonna do that. And you can see here, we have a constructor. I don't have a default constructor. I wanted to make this uh, something of an immutable class. Um, and I'm gonna scroll down here. And it looks like we've got just getters. So this is an immutable. Once a person is, is created, they are that person. And so uh, we don't change their name. Uh, and again, I'm not modeling the fact that this person could one day be married and they may change their surname or they may legally change their name. That, that, that's not what this application is for. This is just a simple example, but we've got a person and we can model things about this person. And this person <clears throat> actually has attributes that are themselves objects, strings and gender. We'll get to that in just a second. And a calendar is an object provided to us by or a class provided to us by the JDK uh, that keeps track of dates and helps us do some date stuff. So we now know more about a person, but how do we get that person into our family? Because we just had strings in our simple family. So let's take a look at a new version of our family model, where now we have a person object as our father and a person object is our mother, and a list of person objects is our children. So the first thing I wanna highlight is the array list is, is known as a generic data type. So the array list has no idea what type of object we're gonna ask it to hold for us. We have to tell it inside the angle brackets. And so in this array list, we're holding a person, whereas in our simple family, we ask the array list to hold strings. So you can hold any object in an array list. So that actually ends up being very handy because we don't wanna write our own array list for every different data type we might wanna store in a list. And so these Java generics, when they added these in Java 5, were just a blessing to us because we only had a, a very simple class that had a lot of problems with it before that. And so adding strong typing to our list of things was just a, a beautiful gift from the Java people when they did that for us. Uh, we have a constructor where we take in a father and a mother and we initialize our children at zero as an empty list. And then we've got getters and setters for father and mother. I guess in this class, we're making it a little bit more robust. And we've got add child, we've got get children count, and we've got get child. So we've simplified it a little bit. It's not the exact same class. We don't have the adding a list of children all at once, but uh, the caller could do that themselves by putting their own objects in, in, a, in a for each loop and calling add child. So we've simplified it just a little bit. Um, and now we've got, we've got this relationship between a family and a set of people, a set of person objects. And let's go one step further and describe the gender. So if we go into the person, we'll see that the, the person has a gender object that comes in as well. And the gender, if we come over and look at the gender, we've just, we're deciding that this is the biological gender of a person, so it's male or female. And the, you'll notice that this is an enum instead of a class. And an enum in Java is a special type of class where all of the possible values that our program can support for that class are identified ahead of time at design time. And so uh, in our case, we know that the gender will be either male or female. And then when we use gender in our code, it, the compiler will only allow us to set male or female. So for example, I'll just type something here really quick. If I say gender dot, it'll give me only the values male and female. And I can't say gender dot other or gender undecided because those aren't options available to me. I can only say male or female. So that's what an enumeration does. I'm not looking to start any uh, debates about gender. I'm just uh, using that as an option to illustrate the principle of an enumeration. So once again, an enumeration is a special type of class in Java. Uh, all programming languages have enumerations. Um, Javas are particularly powerful because they are truly a special kind of class and not just a basic data type. 
and uh, they allow us to do a lot more than what we've demonstrated here, but the general principle across all languages is that an enumeration exists because we know all of the possible values that a object could have uh, as we're designing our program. So uh, a person then has a gender and they've, they've got a date of birth and we can actually see down here, we've got a get age that'll allow us to calculate that person's age. And our family is made up of a set of people. And what we're actually describing is the relationship between three classes. So if I pull up our UML for our family, for our model, what we've got here is we've got our family class and it's made up of a set of people or I keep saying people, it's made up of a set of persons. Make that clear what we're referring to in our software. And our person is made up of a calendar and I could actually have a calendar object um, listed out here as a, as a dependency of our person. And I could do a string, but we're gonna treat calendar and string as sort of primitive data types because they're built into Java and we don't really have to know anything more about them because it's already understood what they are because they're part of Java. Uh, but our gender is something we invented in, in for our code. So we definitely represent that in our model. Uh, you'll notice that there are lines between these and there's a little bit of difference. Uh, I'll explain the lines first. So in the chapter, it, it talks about aggregation and how one class could aggregate another class. And so all that simply means is that one class refers to and holds the values of another class and in its properties, in its fields. And so in this case, a family has a relationship to a person in that a person can belong to a family, but a person could belong to more than one family. For example, I belong to my, the family that starts with my mom and dad and all my siblings are the children. Um, I also belong to a family where I am the father and my wife is the mother and my five children are the children in the family. And I could also potentially belong to another family where uh, my wife's parents are the parents if we wanted to model spouses in here. So we could, we could actually, if we wanted to get really technical, we could change our application and have children be families <laughs> and we could model all the way down to grandchildren and great grandchildren that way if we wanted to do that. There's nothing wrong with a class referring to itself uh, as, as its own field. So we could do that. Um, we're not going to do that in this example, but we could do that. So the, the arrow is a, has a hollow beginning. And so the direction goes like this from the, from the, the owning class to the class that gets owned or used. And in this case, since the person is not necessarily restricted to being in only one family, we're gonna say that this is a uses relationship or a simple aggregation relationship. A family aggregates a set of people. So the, the dot is hollow. In the case of a gender though, a gender can't exist on its own. The gender has to be part of a person. And so this is an owns relationship or a composition relationship. And so the uh, arrowhead or the arrow starts with a solid dot that represents ownership. And then that the fact that the gender is not a freestanding thing, it has to be part of a person. And once again, a person could be part of multiple families. So a, a person is not tied to a single family. So that explains the relationships between the classes in our UML diagram. This is the cardinality indicator. This tells us how many of each can belong. So in this case, what we're saying is a star means many or any, any number. So a family could have any number of persons and a person could belong to any number of families. That's how you read that. A person has a single gender and a gender belongs to a specific person. So um, that's how we read that. And, and oftentimes we'll leave the cardinality off of our diagrams professionally because uh, it should be obvious to our team members what we're talking about. And we, we usually are using words while we're drawing pictures and we convey enough meaning but if we're being very true to the UML uh, standard and way of life, we would indicate the cardinality as well. 
and this is this is almost all of the UML that we use professionally on a day-to-day -day basis and we'll talk about inheritance next week where we'll introduce one more type of relationship between classes uh, but after that uh, you'll know as much UML as I really ever use on a day-to-day -day basis in my professional work there is a lot more to UML than just what we're showing a lot more but from a day-to-day -day communicating our ideas to our team members this is pretty much how we get the job done plus the inheritance that we'll show next week so this is our model and you can see now we've looked at the source code our family our family is made up of people i keep saying that our family is made up of persons and our um, person is made up of a name a gender and a date of birth and with that date of birth we can calculate the age so that is actually our um, that's our model and that's kind of the theory of object-oriented encapsulation and relationships between classes for the for the week uh, there is a demonstration I've got the, there's a main application in our code samples for week nine that shows uh, the test program that we wrote to to create the family and calculate their ages so I encourage you to go look at that um, and at this point, we're going to move on to giving a demonstration of what you're going to have to do to accomplish the assignment this week. Let me take a quick sip of water. And we're going to clear out this example. And we're going to open up a summary of what we're going, what's going on in the assignment. So in the assignment this week, you're going to generate or create a my point object or class. Uh, your my point class will have an X and a Y coordinate, and uh, you'll have a couple of constructors that you have to build. One is a default noar constructor, one is a convenience constructor that takes the X and Y value immediately. Uh, you'll have getters and setters for X and Y, and then you will have three distance methods, and you're gonna calculate the distance method uh, being able to pass in three different ways of three different types of parameters and so we're going to illustrate that because that tends to throw most people and it, it really shouldn't uh, we'll also demonstrate the dry the dry principle of software and that's an acronym that stands for don't repeat yourself and so we're calculating the difference in area between two rectangles is what our example is going to be today uh, we only want to do that calculation once we don't want to do it three different ways because then if I have a bug and I've copied that bug into all three methods and I have to go back and fix three methods where if I just did it in one place and found a way to call it from the other two then I only have to fix the bug in one place so uh, I'll give you one word of warning for the assignment uh, you might be tempted to go out on the internet and look for how to model a point in Java and you're gonna get all sorts of references to classes that exist already in Java about points, X and Y coordinates. And you're not supposed to use any of those. You're supposed to create your own my point class. So uh, don't get caught up in that because I can't give you credit for it if you didn't write it. And using those other point classes is probably going to cause you problems, especially since most of them are defined under Java FX. And as we've recommended using the open JDK uh, for your Java environment for our class, you probably don't have JavaFX installed as part of OpenJDK and you'll get warnings or errors when you try to use those classes. Um, just, a, just a tip to you. So here we go. We're gonna create, uh, we're gonna start with our rectangle class from, uh, what was it, last week? And we're gonna enhance it. We're gonna add an area difference method, but we're gonna add three different styles of the method or overloads, same name, different parameters that means we're overloading the area difference method and that's an important term to remember we're overloading the area difference method one will be an area difference that takes another rectangle object as a parameter and we will calculate the the difference between our area the current triangle or rectangles area and the other the other rectangle that got passed in we're going to calculate both areas and take the difference between the two um, we're also going to calculate the area difference when we pass in just a simple width and height 
and that represents a logical rectangle even though it's not an actual rectangle object. And then finally, we're going to have a static method that calculates the area difference between two rectangle objects. And remember, static methods apply to the class. They don't store any data about a rectangle in and of themselves. And so you have to pass in everything, in a static method, you have to pass in everything you need so that there's no dependency on what might be held in a particular object of that class or a particular spot in memory. So then we're gonna create a rectangle object with dimensions 10 by 15, length and, and width, or width and length, it won't matter. Um, we're gonna create a new rectangle object with the dimensions provided by the user. And we're gonna read them for the keyboard and then we'll demonstrate how to read them from the args array. And then we're going to calculate the difference in area between the two rectangles using each of these three method styles. All right, are you ready? So we're gonna split our window and keep our instructions over here on the side. So I think we go to window, editor tabs, split vertically. That gives us our assignment over here. I'm gonna move that over there and I can close. Actually, let's start up and open our rectangle class here. So I've already started with the rectangle class that we had in the previous week's assignment. And so, um, we all know it's me as the author, we can get rid of that line. That's from using some very old code, I think. So we have our get area, and you know, IntelliJ will actually, sometimes it makes the code a little bit harder to read. It's one of the reasons I like Visual Studio Code for my day-to-day -day work, is it doesn't have some of the fancy things that confuse people if they don't know what's going on. But you'll notice that uh, IntelliJ will highlight the brackets, and for simple methods, it'll put them all on one line. I don't actually care for that. I don't. I wish it wouldn't help me do that. I'm sure I could turn it off if I used IntelliJ often enough that it mattered. I'd go figure out the configuration for it. But now we need to create our area difference methods. So we're going to start with the first one. We're going to create a public int, and it looks like uh, we're dealing with doubles in our rectangle. So I'm going to modify our our uh, data here, and we're going to call this. Well, I take it back. I'm gonna I'm gonna modify my class here, and we're gonna go with ints. We're only gonna take integers for our width and height in this assignment because I believe that my point is based on integers. And so we'll fix these things up. That makes us happy, but the area can now be an integer because we're multiplying integers. The perimeter can now be an integer because we're just adding and multiplying integers. If we were to calculate like the diagonal across where we'd have to do some division, we might have to support fractions, but we're not doing any of that. We're just gonna calculate the area difference now. So so we're gonna say public int, and this, this prototype is given right to us. We could actually copy this over from the assignment and public, and what we're saying is we're public, so anyone who has our, an object of our class can call this method because it's public. It returns an int, the name of the method is area difference, and the parameter is another rectangle object. And we, we've named it other rectangle for clarity. So um, this is the cool thing, is we can, we can actually use our what we know about rectangles, because we are the rectangle, we know what's inside. We could actually say width, width and height directly on the other rectangle. We're not gonna do that here, but it, it's something that you could keep in mind. So first we need to calculate, calculate our own area, and then we're gonna calculate the other rectangle's area. Then we're going to subtract theirs from ours. So that if ours is smaller, we'll actually end up with a negative difference. That's okay. Uh, your assignment this week, you will also need to handle negative values input by the user. All right, so that should be it. So this is a very simple way to calculate. We're going to say, um, int 
I'll say my area, because uh, I'm talking about me as a rectangle, equals get area. And I'm calling get area, and because I'm not saying, I'm not qualifying it at all, it's going to assume that it's being called on the current object. So I'm calling get area for myself. And then I'm going to call the other area. I'm going to say int other area equals other rectangle dot get area. So now I've got the other area. And then I simply say return my area minus other area. And that's all there is to it. So the my point class that you're going to write for the assignment this week actually has you calculating the distance between the two points. And so there is going to be some division, some square rooting uh, using the Pythagorean theorem. Uh, the announcement for the week gives you the steps for the Pythagorean theorem and you can assemble them into your own method. Um, but you'll, your distance between two points, even though your X and Y are integers, because you're doing a square root operation, the result is going to be a double. So uh, your, your distance method will return a double, whereas in our example here, area doesn't do any dividing or square rooting, so we can keep our data types as ints. So we're going to return an int. Now that our method's written, written we can write the documentation. I know that's backwards, but it's just so, easy, so much easier when IntelliJ puts all the things in the comment for us. So calculate the difference in areas. Wow. Difference in areas between me and another rectangle. All right. Well, that was easy. Returns the difference in area. All right. So that takes care of that first method. Now we're going to write another overload of this method that takes in a width and a height. And this is where people start to panic. Please don't panic. Let's just, let's just copy our method here right out of the assignment. That way we know we have it. And I guess now that it's written, we can have our comment here. We'll say calculate the difference in areas between me and another rectangle's width and height. All right. And it returns the difference in area. Now remember, we have the DRY, the dry principle. Don't repeat yourself. We already know how to calculate a the difference in areas. We've already done it once. I don't want to do it again. I just want to find a way to, given what I have available to me, which is a width and a height, how can I turn that into something that I can use to call this method? Well, this method takes a rectangle, and the rectangle can be created using a width and height. So why don't we create a temporary rectangle? So we can say rectangle temp equals new rectangle width and height and we'll just pass those two parameters in to a new rectangle and then all I have to do is return the area difference for this temp rectangle and now this method is going to call this method that was pretty darn easy wasn't it And that's, that's all there is to it. That's it. That's done. <clears throat> so let's go do this third one. This is, the, this is the other one where people get really tripped up and they don't need to get really tripped up. I'm just going to do some cheating here. It's all the same comment. The only thing that's different is the parameters. They should be obvious. But there is one thing um, that we probably want to highlight in our commentary. We would say uh, the difference is relative to rect one, which means if the if rect two's area is smaller. Is that how we implemented that? If 
Yeah. So if rec two's area is greater, then the result will be a negative number. And that it's kind of implied up here in these other two because they're in their methods on a specific rectangle, but this is a static method. So it's not a method on any particular rectangle. We can't actually use width and height. I mean, look here, if I say width in here, then IntelliJ says, I don't know what you mean by width. Even if I said this dot width, there is no this inside of static methods because this points to a specific object of a method or of, of a class. And the static means there is no object. So there's no width that we can work with. So what we have to do is we're just going to simply say, and this is, this is why it's, it's really easy and why it's, I, I know that at this point in the class, you've done a lot of reading and it's very abstract and it's hard to make sense of. And you get to this assignment and you say, I don't even know where to start. And so I'm walking you through, this is exactly how the my point is gonna work. You have to develop a my point class and then you have to add three distance methods and they work exactly like the, our area difference, that the calculation's different, the math is different. I give that to you in the announcement. But now we have our, our static and, and what can we do? Well, we, we know that a rectangle object is going to have an area difference that takes another rectangle object as a parameter. So why not just do this, rect1, and why don't we just return this, we'll say return rect1 dot area difference and pass in rect2. That's it, that's really all you have to do. So we've implemented our logic in exactly one place. We've created overloads that basically become convenience methods for whatever the caller might have handy to them uh, to be able to call area difference from some different ways. That's all we've done. And each of these ways knows how to, how to call the one area difference that actually has the calculation implemented. There is a little bit that we would want to do in this method and this method when it comes to checking for errors. I'm going to hold off on doing that. I will not in this week's assignment submit anything that will cause your code to blow up. Um, but we would probably, if we're writing really robust professional code, we would check to make sure that the rectangle passed in here and the rectangles passed in here are not null. And if they're null, we would throw some kind of an exception. So I'm not gonna cloudy that up, but in two weeks, we will get to exceptions and it'll make a lot more sense. So our rectangle class is now ready to go. So now we just need to create a test program. We're gonna call this w9.example. And we're gonna say Java class, we'll use our nifty temple template w9 dot example and we'll slide this over here into this window can we do that really seriously let's put our focus here and open them here there we go so we're going to test our rectangle class all right so the first thing we're gonna do is we are going to write our test using input from the user. So uh, we're gonna need our scanner. So we'll say import java.util.scanner. And then we will simply say try, and we'll open our scanner. So we'll say var input equals new scanner based on system.in. And at this point, we're ready to go. So we will prompt the user system.out.println. Enter the width of a rectangle. And I forgot that I like to do print. All right, and we will say int width equals 
input.next int. And I'll say system.out.print. Enter the height of a rectangle. Int height equals input.next int. So we've got our user input, that's cool, ready to go. And now we're going to, and you'll notice here, just a, there are a couple of students still in the class that have this question. You don't have to create a new scanner every time you ask the user to enter something. You can create a single scanner and use it multiple times. So just keep that in mind. So now it, the assignment says we're going to create a rectangle of a specific size. And the assignment for your homework, it's going to, you're going to create a my point at a specific coordinate. So we're going to say rectangle. I could say bar here if I wanted to. Uh, you know, Java lets us do that now, like I did up here. Either way, but I'll, I'll make it clear. We're creating a rectangle. Rectangle. Rect1 is a new rectangle at 10 and 15 dimensions, width and height. So now I've got my rectangle, and then I'm going to create a new rectangle using the width and the height entered by the user. So I'll say rectangle rect2 equals new rectangle width and height. Fix my typos. Now I've got two rectangles. Now I need to um, calculate the difference in area between the two rectangles using the three different area methods that we've defined. So we're going to say system.out.format using method one. The difference is percent %d and a new line. And we're going to say that the difference is rect one dot area difference from rect two. Well, that was easy. So why don't we copy this line of code so we don't spend so much time rewriting it using method two. And method two is passing in the width and the length or the width and the height directly. So we can say we'll use the same width and height that we used to create rectangle two. So that takes care of that. And then our third method is going to be to call that static method. And so our static method here is actually going to be rectangle dot area difference and we're going to pass in both rectangles. And again, the reason is the static version. So here's, here's where you can see that it's static. We can call it directly on the class. We don't have to have an object of the class to call the method. Static methods exist on the class, not on the individual objects. And since they exist on the class, they don't have a width and a height associated with them. So we have to pass in everything they need. And so we're going to pass in both rectangles. And then we know from our definition here that we're going to use one of the rectangles to call the area difference with the other rectangle. So that's our example. And we are absolutely 100% ready to run this and watch it work. So why don't we run it? Enter the width of a rectangle. I'm going to say 10 and 10. So let's think about how what our test case should be. So we know we have a rectangle. Our reference rectangle is 10 by 15. So that's going to be an area of 150, whatever the units are. So if I pass in a 10 by 10, then I should get an area of 100. So the difference is going to be 50. 100, it's going to be um, 150 minus 100. So we'll have a difference of 50. And there we go. Using method one, two, and three, the difference is 50. So why don't we walk through this in the, in the debugger so you can watch it. And then uh, to finish off, we will uh, quickly do an example using the args from our, 
our main method. But let's uh, start right here. We'll put a breakpoint on this line and we'll, we'll run it to this point. We're going to enter the width of a rectangle. We're gonna say 10 and 10. And here we are. You can see, what, we, what do we have in memory? Um, we've got our args that are passed in. There's nothing passed in. Our input is a scanner object. We don't really care what it holds at this point. We've read the values 10 and 10 from the user into our width and height, and we've created two rectangles. One is a rectangle of dimensions 10 and 15. That's our reference that we created. It's hard-coded up here on line 17. And then our second rectangle is our 10 by 10 that we provided as user input. You'll notice that IntelliJ helps us out and says, look, these are two rectangle objects, but they're at different memory locations. So there you go. All right, uh, and keep in mind the memory locations because we're gonna check something when we get down to that, this static method here. So we are in our example method, or our main method of our example class. We're gonna step in here and go into we actually want to go into the area difference. So here we are. So now we're going to step into get area. You'll notice this is rectangle at 945, and the other rectangle is the one at 946. So if we go out here, you can see here, rect 1 is the 945, and rect 2 is the 946. So we know what we've got when we come into our method here. So if I dive into my get area method, then I'm right here and this is still pointing at 945 and we can see what's inside of this is our 10 by 15. So this is gonna return our 100. So we'll step out of here and my area, sorry, my 150. Duh, can't even do math while I'm recording videos, can I? So this is my 150. So now we're gonna calculate the get area on the other rectangle. So notice that when we were, you know, when we were in our get area method, we were, this was pointing at 945, but we're now about to call the get area method on the other rectangle. So the this pointer, when we go in there, should say 946. So let's dive into that. And here we are, this is now pointing to object location 946. That's how the this pointer works. This is always pointing to the current object. And this is our 10 by 10, got that right this time, so this should return 100. So our other area is 100, and now we simply do the math, and we return, and our output shows us over here, the difference is 50. Cool, let's keep going. Let's dive into this one, and let's go into area difference. And now we're gonna create a new rectangle. So if I dive into here, so I what, what's my this? Let's look at this. My this is still 945, because that's our reference rectangle. That's our rect one that we created out in main. But if I dive into this, now I'm creating a new rectangle object and it's at 961. That's not either of our two. Our others are 945 and 946. This is 961. The, the actual value doesn't matter. It's just the fact that it's different. So we're creating a new rectangle that's totally separate from any of the other two that we, are, we know we're working with in our program. And this is our temporary rectangle, and we had to create it so we could simply call this method. So this is now 945 again, and if we step into here, then we're back into this one where this is 945, because that's our reference, that's us. But the other rectangle is now the one that we just created, the temp one at 961. So we'll step over this, and we'll see that our area is returned. We should see the same result, which we do. We've already seen that happen, we trust that. And now here's the static. Let's look into the static and see where we go. We'll click the area difference. And what do we have in here? So we're in area difference of a rectangle, but there's no memory address associated with it because there's no object associated with this method. There's no pointer to any spot in memory where we could find a width and a height for us because this is associated with the class. Now, technically under the hood, there is a spot in memory where this class 
structure is loaded, but it's totally irrelevant to us. We cannot access it without doing some crazy stuff, which we're, we're not going to do. So uh, we simply say, when we have a static, we have no this. We have no spot in memory. However, our parameters, they're on the call stack. So they came in as local variables. They do have a spot in memory because those are actual rectangle objects. And it's our friends 945 and 946 again. So I'm going to dive in here. We're just going to call rect one's difference for rect two. And this is basically, this is the exact same call we're making out here. It's the exact same call. So we'll step in and here we are. This is 945 and the other is 946. We've seen this work before, so we'll just step through it real quick. And we return, we have our output and our program is then done. So that's debugging our program. That is our program for the week. So hopefully walking through this and talking through it will help you not panic when you go to do the assignment. And I can always tell who has watched the video all the way through and who hasn't by the level of panic when they post questions to the discussion boards. Um, I'm happy to answer your questions. I know not everybody has time to watch the video, uh, but if you do have time, it is well worth your time usually because it'll save you uh, several hours of frustration before you decide to ask the questions and get the help you need. But okay, let's get off that soapbox and do a quick example using our arguments. So we'll demonstrate the same thing using args from the command line. So we will say, um, the first thing we probably want to do is just double check that we, we have args. So I'm going to say if args.length is less than two, we need two things, then we're just going to return. So we won't go any further. So now we know we have at least two things in args, and I'm gonna assume they're ints. And when we get to week 11 and we, we start learning about error handling, then we will start testing your ability to not make assumptions and testing to make sure that you have inputs. But for now, I'm gonna assume that we have two ints passed in on the command line. So I'm going to say, um, we're gonna rename our width, we're gonna get a new value for our width. I, I don't have to call it int width, actually I do because that was created inside of the try block and the try block is done. So that's a, the word in a new scope. So I'll say int width equals, actually we have to do an integer dot parse int because args come in as strings. And we're gonna say args sub zero, that's the first element. And int height equals integer dot parse int arg sub one. All right. And then everything else here is exactly the same. Exactly the same. So you are free to use the args to get your inputs or you can do the scanner and get your inputs from the user. We've, we've used the scanner a lot this semester and I want to, this is the first semester I've ever actually opened it up and showed you how to use the args. Um, we use the args far more often than we read values from the user directly from the keyboard. So it, if you didn't use the args in the last assignments that needed user input, then I highly encourage you to try using it this time. Either way is fine. I don't take points or you don't get extra credit for using the args either, but it's, it's in your best interest to learn how to use arguments passed into the, into the program. So let's, let's actually we'll change our breakpoints here and we're gonna debug our program I have not added any arguments to the command line for this program. So we, we should get a return here at line 32 as we walk through it. I have to get through the first part of my program, so I'll do a 10 and a 10. And now we're at the stop. And since args is empty, and you can see it has no arguments in it at all, then we're just going to say, oh, we don't have enough here. And we bail out. All right, so remember to set the arguments, if you're gonna use args instead of keyboard input, you'll come up here to the run configurations and you'll edit configurations and you'll take your w9.example or in your case, your w9.1 and you'll come over here and find program arguments. And you're gonna say 10, actually I'm gonna do a 12 by 12, how's that? We'll do a 12 by 12. 
So that should be 144, and so our difference should be six. So I'll say okay there, and I will run the program. And this will be our 10 by 10. We get 150, and then we we went right through and did our our uh, args method, and we had different values. We had our 12 by 12, so we got area was 144 subtracted from 150 gives us a difference of six. So okay, um, that's it. A uh, little bit shorter than usual, uh, not by much though. So I appreciate your sticking with us for an hour. If you have questions, please post them in the discussion board. I look forward to working with you this week and I hope it's a great week for you. Thanks.